So my talk today is not going to be the same talk I gave last time. Uh, last time I had a discussion about kind of analytics, how it got into sports, and then specifically how we might use it inside of water polo. Today I want to talk about implementing analytics. So when I had that talk last time, at the end of it, I got a ton of questions, which was really exciting and a lot of fun. But one of the things that came out of all those questions is I had to say a number of times, I'm sorry, but I can't really talk about that because it's proprietary. And so my goal today of this presentation, and I'm sure you've seen this quote before, is you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a man a fish, you feed him for a lifetime. My goal is more to help everyone learn or work through a process that we use at Pacific to implement analytics inside of our program in hopes that it can maybe help you find more ways to analyze situations for your teams. So that instead of doing exactly what we do or necessarily taking our information, you can go out and do these things for yourselves inside your own programs. So with that, I would like you to watch this video here. And during this video, what I want you to kind of concentrate on is there's going to be some center clips. I want you to watch and say, what would you do here? What do you think is going to happen? And what would you tell your defense to do or your center defenders to do in this situation? So a ball comes into two meters right here. What do you think is going to happen in this situation? What's the likely outcome? What do you think is going to happen based on where the defense is, the droppers, who's crashing, the position of the defender, the goalie? And what would you tell your defense to do? So as you look at that, what could, what, what could end up coming out of this? In just a second, the video will start going again. And right here, what is going to happen is a missed shot. OK? Next situation, we're going to watch an, a few clips of, video, of center play. So we, this is all UOP versus UCLA. We ha picked this because I believe that UCLA's center, number nine, I think was the best center in the conference. So what would happen here? What do you think is going to happen here? What would you tell your defense to do? What's the right decision? And so the ball goes into number nine. We look like we have a crash from four and from two. And miss shot. OK? Looks like we got a crash from three. We're pressed out at one and two. Doesn't look like any real help is coming from there. Ball's entered to his right hand on that side. What's going to happen? What's, what's the defense going to do? What should they do? What's the result? Miss shot. OK, so now what do we got? The left side is at, occupied right now with something. They don't look like they're going to get in the defense. Maybe some help from the guy up top on the left. The other two guys look like they're in bad body position. What's going to happen here? What should happen? OK, goal. We got a crash coming from two. Similar entry. This is not the same clip. Similar situation. Is the guy from four going to be able to help on time? Oh, is that what you thought was going to happen? Did you think that was going to happen? <laughs> No, it was a goal. What's going to happen here? You got crash from here, you got, uh, from up top at four. Looks like one's going to get in the play. What would you have your center defender do?
So what's going to happen here? Is it only going to get in the defense? It's a turnover. OK. So, so, so now, based on that, how many of you got all of those situations correct? Called it when they scored, called it when they missed, called it when it was getting stolen. So the question is, how can you possibly teach your center defenders to make decisions based on when the ball comes in? If we as coaches are sitting here watching this in slow motion, okay, how could we tell them, well, hey, if when the ball comes in, if it's not a good pass, don't take it, if this, that, or the next thing. That's really hard to do live in the moment. We can't, we can barely do it right now, Call, predict what's going to happen out, the outcome. So we have to have a philosophy, right? And so there's a prevailing philosophy out there, which is, is it better to uh, to take an exclusion or to let the center shoot. The philosophy out there, what's promoted, I heard it uh, when I was watching the championship game uh, in the MPSF tournament on the commentary. I heard it uh, in the game that with Brown and San Diego this last week. Same comment was made by the people doing the analysis, which is, oh, that was a good ejection. Statistically speaking, it was smart to take the exclusion instead of let the center shoot. So is this the case? So, well, if this is the case, then we would expect something like this to occur, right? This would be a situation in which you go, all right, this would make me want to do that. If the center shoots 60% on six on five, okay, and our six on five shoots 40%, then we would want to take an exclusion, right? The center shoots 20% better than the six on five. But then why do we play six on five the way we do? why wouldn't we try to just find a way to get the ball back into the center? They shoot 60%. Why would we play six on five? That's a sucker's move, right? But we play six on five because we think it's a good opportunity. In fact, how is it possible, and I said this in the last talk, that when the center draws an ejection, the offensive coach is like, yes. And when the, the center, center defender gets ejected, the defensive coach is like, good job. How are we both happy at the same time? That's, that's, something's wrong, right? There's some kind of problem in here. So, um, so we're going to skip this poll. Um, what data do we need to answer these questions? So I want you to think about that for a second. What do we need? What do we need to answer the question of whether or not we should be taking exclusions at center? So, go ahead. How many times the ball goes in versus how many times the shot's taken? And then what's their six on five versus five on six? Yeah. So, so yeah, you need, you need information about how many times the ball goes in, right? You need, you need information on shots. You need information on turnovers, okay? Offensive fouls, even, okay? So this, this, I think, to start out with, you could look at those like in a situation where you're going to go, hey, I'm going to go in a deep, deeper analysis and go, should we take an exclusion in this particular um, positioning, right? So we got a player outside the post. What are the odds of them scoring? Absolutely, that can be taken into account. But in general right now, we're just trying to answer this going, hey, what's the general philosophy? Is it better or not when we take all center shots and we have to go back and define what's a center shot? So I'll give you a definition right now of what a center shot is. A center shot would be some person that goes in and attempts to establish vertical position by themselves and first alone. Okay? Inside the posts, okay? Inside four meters. Okay? That would be a center shot. Okay? So anyone, who, if you go in and two players go in at the same time, that's not, and one of them gets the ball, this is not necessarily a center shot. Okay, now if a player is po already in its center and someone comes in and becomes a second center, that's not necessarily a center shot. Okay, we could take all of those into account, but we're talking about center shots that have the ability to work any position they want directly in front of the cage. Okay, so you need to look at these. And how are we gonna, how are we gonna collect this data? So we're gonna collect this data off video 
and some of it live, right? The big part about this is when we do this, and I'm thinking about how I'm going to answer this question, because this is the process I went through in 2012. Okay? In 2011, I did a statistical project. In 2012, I decided to ha do an experiment and turn my team into a petri dish. Okay? So this is, these are the answers that we started to come up with. How off, uh, so we're going to take, take this information off video. Why am I going to use video so much? Because your stats on the bench are unreliable. Okay? How many times you got your stat sheet, looked at it, and went like, it says this guy had three ejections, but in the book it doesn't say this. Or it says this guy took two shots, but I know they had three goals. <laughs> so you can't trust the stuff off the bench. So you have to go to video, and you have to make sure it's 100% accurate all the time. Then what metrics are we going to use to evaluate this data? So we came up with two metrics. Everyone understand what I'm talking about when I speak about our metric? We got to put this in terms of something, right? We got to put this in terms of how are we going to quantify this and compare it to each other? So what we're going to do is we're going to turn everything kind of into goals. So we're going to look at conversion rate, and conversion rate is different than shooting percentage. So shooting percentage is just, everyone knows, you take how many goals versus your total shots, right? Conversion rate would be the total times you have all your goals divided by your total use, right? So if you have, uh, at center, we have 10 situations. We score three goals, okay? We take, miss four shots, and we have three turnovers. Your conversion rate is 30%. And that's important to think about because you need to be looking at all of the opportunities. And then goals per use comes into play when you're talking about how many times did you t use this thing completely, this particular tactic. So, for instance, if I threw the ball into center, but um, there was an ordinary foul. That was an attempt at the tactic, right? So that's going to go in to goals per use. And then we're in goals per use, we're going to create a formula. And this formula is going to look like this. It's going to take your goals plus the exclusions drawn. And then you're going to multiply that by your six on five scoring, your conversion rate, plus your penalties times your penalty conversion rate divided by your total use. Okay? So this is goals per use. So we're going to create these two metrics, and we're going to use these two metrics to help evaluate whether or not this is a good choice. And then what are we going to do to check this? We're going to use a two-proportion test, which is a test that they use in statistics. You get a p-value. I'm not going to go into all that for you guys right now. But you get this p-value that tells you whether or not these two things are likely from the same population or not. That means, would you expect them to behave the same? Okay. So. Let's look at some information. This right here is from 2011 MPSF tournament. Okay. So this is where it all started. This is when this came to me. This is how the project began. So we looked at six on five offense in center, and we have attempts. Okay. We have goals, turnovers, exclusions, off offensives, penalties, conversion rate, and goals per use. Now, what are we looking at here? Okay. Well, your attempts are your total. Your total shots, right? So in a conversion rate right here at center play, they're converting 11% of the time into goals. Okay? Every time something happens at center, you have an 11% chance that turns into a goal. So we have to use it about 10 times, okay? And, and 10 times we're going to get a little over a goal. On six on five, our conversion rate is 35%. Are your goals including goals on the exclusions and penalties? Yes. Yes. Yeah, they're including them. So uh, that goes back to that formula that I was talking about before, which is the, 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 uh, the goals per, per use, which would be down. That would be, sorry, that is included here. Okay, Up here, this is just conversion rate without the exclusions and penalties. Those aren't included in it. So this is conversion rate without these two. So you're just looking at straight out of center without taking the benefit of exclusions. Mm-hmm, correct. I have so some the first um, example you used three goals four missed shots three turnovers if I'm looking at it from the offensive point of view yeah. if our center got off seven shots yeah but he missed four because maybe the goalie made good good set is it wrong to look at it as that's a 70 percent 70 percent we got a good offensive look 
out of it. We didn't score every time we took a shot, but we got shots off. Our center got shots off. I don't know if that's a different way of looking at it that might. I, I think when, when it comes to like looking at um, whether it's a good look or this, that, or the next thing. To me, that all comes down to knowing every single uh, tactic you can use and what the odds of scoring using those tactics are. And then based on that, you're going to quantify in this position, pos possession, we had the following options at, the, at this moment, right? We had a chance to take a perimeter shot, we had a chance to throw the ball into the center, and we had a chance to take a direct shot. What would have been the best choice? That's going to help us decide whether or not that was a good look based on looking at what was available to us at that time and what was the best chance of scoring. So we have this conversion rate, okay? And then when you look at goals per use, because exclusions get added in and penalties get added, added in, center value jumps up, okay, to 21% chance that if we put the ball in the center, we're going to end up getting a goal out of this possession. So that means one out of five times. But over here on six on five, we're still staying the same. Why? Because at center, we have a lot of turnovers, right? A lot of turnovers and offensives. This is creating negative or negative value inside the position. Here, we have very few turnovers. We have mostly shots. So that's why the conversion rate and goals per use are going to look very, very similar. Okay? Along with their shooting percentages are going to look very similar to conversion rate, but not exact. I have a question about yeah. the data. So yeah. in column B, is that the sum of the total possessions? No. Okay, so it's, There's only, no, there, it's only when you put the ball in the set. Yeah, okay. correct. It has nothing to do with the possessions. And this is taken from all 12 games at the MPSF tournament. And the six on fives could be transition exclusions as well, right? Any so time there was an exclusion, center. yes. Okay. So if it's all 12 games, so, um, different team, and also more importantly, different centers, because a strong center conversion rate can be a heck of a lot different than there's a center on their own team or a second team. Right. So that's a great point. Right? So everyone has, you know, you have this person shooting on six on five and this person shooting at center. Rates change, absolutely. This is the average of the conference. And so what this is helping us do is say, hey, typically what would happen, not on this great center or this weaker center, but typically what happens in this, and is it a better overall decision to be able to make this, to be able to decide whether you want to take an exclusion or not, right? So the, the thing about it is when you go to, well, I'll get, I'm going to get to that in just a second. So if you just give me one second. So um, here's the center shooting. This is a, so we took these, and that would look like a, you know, a decent sample size, but we exploded out using a, a, a statistical process called bootstrapping. So if you look at this, this wasn't the 25 shots and stuff that you saw over here. This is 2.5 times 10 to the fourth. That's how many time, shots we're talking about inside of here. And how to, we made that bigger so that we could see whether or not this would essentially stay the same. And we could trust the data. So we made the data much, much bigger. Yes, 25,000. This is looking at 25,000 shots if it ex acted exactly the same way as it did in the 2011 MPSF tournament. Okay? And then you look at the six on five, and you can look at the mean and the standard deviation, and you can see the 37% okay, conversion rate. You can see the 28% shooting percentage for centers. And so after looking at these two things in 2011, okay, the conclusion yep. I'd have to come to would be, let's let the center shoot, right? Because everything in there is pointing towards the shooting percentage is lower and out, of, out of center. The shooting percentage is higher. Uh, the conversion rate is lower because there's more turnovers at center. We should let the center shoot. Well, now what? Now that we got that, what do we do with that? So this is when we have to decide, are we going to do something about this? Are we going to turn our team into a Petri dish? And the answer to that is definitely we are. Okay? So in 2011, we, were, we had a rough year. I was highly motivated, rock bottom, okay, to change. And so we decided to change. In 2012, we were redshirting some of our top guys. I felt like it was a great opportunity to experiment because there was not going to be a lot of pressure on this season. We we're going to do something different. We think we were going to have a big year in 2013. And if we can find a way to be just a little bit better, because in 2011, even though it was a colossal failure, we lost to every Pac-12 team by one goal. And most of them were in overtime. And all we really needed was to find one more goal. And it's a whole different season for us. So my goal was to find one more goal. And if we could do that, Let's find that in 2012 so we're ready in 2013. 
So what's our hypothesis? And what are we going to do? What are we going to need to test this hypothesis? What are we going to change a strategy? Are we going to change te technique, mentality? What data do we need to collect and verify these results? And how are we going to determine success? This is what we started thinking about. So, uh, so in order to do that, one other thing I wanted to bring up is this also came out of the MPSF tournament. Okay, this is the exclusions at center. And so in the MPSF tournament, there were 54 exclusions called at center with the ball and 49 away without the ball. So when I got that piece of information on that tournament, that helped impact those questions that I just said, which are these. Okay. So what is my hypothesis? Okay. What are we going to look at? So letting the center shoot will cost the team more goals. That's what we're talking about, right? If my hypothesis, sometimes you go, okay, wait, I thought you said we're going to let them shoot. It's going to help us, right? Sometimes it's easier to prove the opposite. Okay? So if I go and say this is the case, then if I can just show that it isn't in any one particular point in time, this whole concept of it's better to let the, take an exclusion than to let the center shoot, if I can show it's not true once, then I've busted the entire myth. I don't have to show it's true every single time. I just have to show it's true, not true one time. Does that make sense to everybody? So this is the goal. So we're going to say that here's the original concept. This is why we don't do it. This is why we take exclusions. I'm going to try to disprove this by showing it one time that this is not true. So what are we going to need to do? Well, we're going to need strategy change. We thought about this. How are we going to be able to decide if we're going to do this, let the center shoot? How are we going to be able to test this? Well, we've got to let them shoot, right? We've got to let them shoot. If we don't let them shoot, then we have, we're not going to get any data. So with looking at that exclusion away from the ball stuff, what conclusion did we come to? We can't press. If we press, we're going to give up tons of exclusions. It's going to take away from the value. There are going to be less shots. We're not going to find out whether it's better or worse to let the center shoot instead of taking exclusion. So we had to say, all right, we're going to play only zone. And so we did. We played only zone for the entire 2012 season. Next, technique change. Yeah, we're not fronting anymore. It's out. Don't do it. Okay, we're going to play directly behind. That's all we're going to do is we're going to play behind. If we're going to let the center shoot, that's what we're going to do. Next, mentality change. I got a question about this in my last talk, which is, uh, how, but how does this affect the, the t players on the team? You know, you, when you give a goal from center, it create, creates momentum for the opponent. It, it depresses your team, these kinds of things. We had to change the mentality of the team because we've all now conditioned our athletes to feel like it's bad when they get scored on out of center. We don't. I don't care if we get scored on out of center. It doesn't matter. Only thing that matters is what rate we're getting scored on. I do not care that we get scored on. If they get scored on one time in the game, fine. They get scored on five times in the game, but they don't take a single other shot in the rest of the game. And all they did was throw the ball to two meters and they scored five goals in the game. Perfect. We won. I do not care that you scored five from center. Okay. So we had to have a mentality change that it was now as personal to get ejected as it was in the past to give up a goal. Okay. So we had to ta have a mentality change. Right. And, and your strategy change and your technique change seem contradictory to me. Because if you're trying to, your strategy change, if you're trying to prove the null, you are, you are trying to allow as many entries as you possibly can, and which would come with more pressing rather than zone. So, 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 so the, the reason why that changes is that in the pressing, we're going to end up taking a ton of exclusions. At center. at center. It just showed fi of almost 50% almost 50 of the exclusions at center were away from the ball. That's still part of your technique which is, change then because you're telling them stay behind. Or, right. I mean, from, your, from the video that I'm watching, right. your technique was stay behind on the left shoulder, hand, on the entry, hands immediately go. Yeah. Right. So, I, I, but again, I'm, I'm saying yeah. in, in your pursuit of proving the null, your strategy change is actually limiting 
limiting touches to. But the pressing ball. is the whole entire concept of pressing is total denial of the ball. So the entire point of pressing is to not give up any shots ever. That's like the definition of what a press is. So in, or, in order to do that, we have to be allowing position for them to shoot without taking exclusions. And if we press, we're going to be in danger of getting ejected without the ball on a regular basis, so we're going to limit our sample size. Right. But you're still trying to prove, again, the null that you're trying to prove is that it's, it's more disadvantageous for the center to score, which means that the center has to touch the ball more, which a zone... The center has to be used more. Okay, so I'm, again, I'm sorry. For yeah. Confusion. No, and I, yeah. I kind of like, I, I'm kind of like siding with Barry. So I've, like, so I've, we press. We press two meters, we're siding, we're fronting. We're, we press to deny passes, right? Yeah. We press to have the ball stall in certain spaces so that, again, in the perfect world, we're not taking exclusions away from the ball because our, set, our defenders know that the ball is under pressure. So if they give up a little bit of a lead anywhere, they're going to have time to recover because the ball is under pressure. Right. If, if, so we don't want the ball. So, so if, 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 you're, if what you're saying is that we should press and play behind, is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying. Because, well, because yeah, I mean, we, 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 we want to still, we, we, st we still need to try to win a game. So, okay, so we still need to try to win a game. So I have to play a viable strategy, right, that I believe has a chance of winning. And if you look at pressing and you look at zone defense and you look at what happens and how they're characterized as far as shots given up, goals, shooting percentages, all these things, you're going to find what zone, zone and press have very drastically different DNAs. And this DNA of a zone is much more suited to finding out what happens with shots than a press is if you look at what happens with zones. So there's a DNA of every defense and, ha and how, it act how each defense gives up goals, and the zone is the best way to find naturals. I, I completely understand that. I'm just saying that in, in your pursuit of proving your hypothesis here, yeah. the yeah. overarching thing was you were still trying to win a game. Yes. So this is not as well. Yes, I mean, Th this, is the best, this is the best we can do. And, um, so what, uh, what data do we need to collect? Center shots, goals, goals against. Six on five attempts and goals for and against. And then how are we going to determine success? So the idea is, is that if we can show that, center, that our centers produce more than our opponents, then we can say that this strategy that we're changing is going to go ahead and disprove this concept. Okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is the data from our season. Okay. And so here we have Pacific centers. Okay. And you have, uh, these are our attempts. Here are our goals. You have our shooting percentages by the games. Same thing for our opponents. You have the exclusions. Okay. And here are the temps, which is like the use of the situation. Okay. Down here, you have some extra stuff because we have all of our games. We have some games minus the Pepperdine game, minus the USC game, minus the Pepperdine and USC game. The reason why we have that data down there is because our, no, our primary center, Alex Obert, uh, broke his finger in the season. He was out for those games, and we had to play a 5'10 sophomore from Florida at center for those games and kind of skewed our center value for a little bit, if you can imagine. Um, but... So this we feel like is the most accurate representation, but nonetheless, the situation. And then down here, we'll kind of take this data, and I'm going to hone in on it a little more tightly in the next slide so you guys can look at what we're interested in. So if you look at this, we're looking at okay, the average goals in a game, the shots, and here are some of the interesting things that happen. Okay? At the end of the season, what happened was, now other teams were pressing. Okay? Other teams in this league pretty much predominantly start in a press and end up in either a zone or a press. We were getting 2.26 shots per game. We were giving up 4.26 sh shots per game. So in the concept of like trying to figure out if we can give up shots, this is happening. But the problem is, is that we gave up two shots per game. And if you take the center shooting value okay, and you figure out what's going on with this, this extra two shots is creating this many goals. right? And we are 
giving up about 1.3 less exclusions than they were. And that was saving us this many goals. Overall, this ended up being a worse strategy by 1.6 goals on this particular part of the data. But that's using the average values of the league. Okay? And the average value of the league, we lose this by over an entire season okay, per game, 1.6 goals. But if you look at this here, this is without the PEP and USC data, which to me is more accurate reflective because we didn't have a center. Because our center value was better than a lot of the league, we ended up winning this by 0.18. So we were giving up shots, not taking exclusions. They were taking exclusions, trying not to give up shots. And we ended up outproducing our opponents by 0.18. Okay? And so when that happened, we felt like this is a, su a success. Okay? That we showed that we gave played zone for an entire season. We let them shoot out of center. We tried never to take an exclusion, although we got excluded. Okay? And we ended up, our centers outproduced the league centers. So what do we do about this? So do we make this experiment permanent? What adjustments do we make? What unintended consequences are there? So we decided that we're going to look at a SWOT analysis. Okay? And so we looked at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And inside that, we realized that, okay, we're able to decrease exclusions. We're able to force kind of a lower percentage shot if you look at center shot shooting percentage versus uh, six on five shooting percentage. The pace of the game was advantageous to us, okay, because the zone, playing the zone, made people work much deeper into the clock. And so we were, were a team where in that year we played about eight, play, eight field players. Most of the time we played seven. So we really only went about one person off the bench. So the pace of the game fit us that year. What weaknesses? We gave up more shots flat out. We had less, we had, the, we weren't able to force as many steals, not at center, but period in our defense compared to our opponents. And we would lose, we lost a lot of first wave counterattack opportunities by playing zone the entire time. What were our opportunities? Well, we were controlling the number one indicator of wins, which from the paper we wrote um, with Waterpolo Analytics Group and John Mayberry primarily, number one indicator of wins is your six on five conversion rate. So whoever wins the six on five conversion rate wins the game typically. And we're able to control that because we're controlling the number of exclusions in, in a game and that has a little bit to do with how good our five man is. In addition to that opportunity, um, Pacific's players' skills, I think this fit our skills because when you talk about press and you talk about zone, the interesting thing is, I don't know if everyone thinks about it this way, but when you play press, you're kind of saying something to everybody, right? What you're saying is, I believe I have a matchup advantage at every position. We did not have a matchup advantage at every position that year, and so this fit our skills. We had a couple players that were small, a couple players that were brand new. We weren't very deep, and this, this fit our advantage. Pressing would have been a very difficult thing for us. And then threats to, uh, to us were officials bias. Okay? And this is where I win a lot of points. Okay? <laughs> so what I mean by officials bias, okay, we did a talk last time, uh, and what we, told, what we said is we found that there is flat out officials bias. An official's bias is not that they're calling for USC versus UCLA or again, uh, for Cal against Pacific or something like this. What we found was that the officials are biased by the state of the game. And so if you look, here are our results of our exclusions throughout the entire season. And what you'll find with the final score down here is very interesting. Okay? We lost our exclusion ratio for the first time against Redlands, but we were winning fairly decently. Okay? Then we lost our exclusion ratio next time against U UCI right here, and we won that game. Also got a red card in that game. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> and then next time we lost our exclusion ratio was to Santa Barbara, in which we were two teams, and maybe they should have been slightly better than us or ranked, but we played extremely well that day. We were hot, and we beat them 12 to 5, and we lost the exclusion ratio in that game when we were winning. And then the only other exclusion ratio we lost that season was to UCLA in the first round of MPSF, and we lost it 11 to 6. And we lost that game. Now, 
that's a little bit different, okay? Why did we lose this exclusion rate ratio? This was when we were, we end up losing a game because we were up by, we were up by three on UCLA at the end of the third quarter. And in that game, we were getting destroyed on the calls. We were playing zone the entire game. They were pressing us, okay? We got excluded 11 to six. And this right here, the chance of this happening was 1%. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Stanford right here. So, so we, uh, this, this 1%, this 1 chance of it happening based on all of, our, all of our exclusion ratios throughout the season. There was only about a 20% chance that we actually only earned six, six, uh, six exclusions. Okay, so 80% chance we we're going to end up drawing more than that. And there was a 1% chance that this, this, this is how many times we were going to get excluded or the ratio was going to be this vastly different in favor of the opponent. And that is part of the official bias that threatens us. And this is actually from this year's MPSF tournament <coughs> and goes to show you if you took the state of the game for all 12 games and looked at it, winning team, losing team, tied team at any point in time in the game, what, these are the exclusions called by the officials when the team, here is the team that is losing, how many exclusions they're drawing when they're losing, this is what it looks like when you're winning. And so the officials are clearly changing the game and being subconsciously biased by the state of the game. And this is difficult for us because if our goal is to not take exclusions, okay, this is a threat to, a threat to our style of play, that if we are winning and we are getting ejected more because of the state of the game, then this is going to be a threat to our strategy. Totally understand that you're, but the, were all these exclusions taken at two meters? Were any of them taken Those? the transition? No, like when you were the UCLA game. The, they, were, they were taken all over the place. But, is it, but if your style of play is irrelevant if your athletes are getting excluded in transition, so your zone really doesn't come into play. If, yeah. they're, if they're getting cut off and getting caught in bad positions because the offensive did a good thing, wouldn't that kind of... That's because I haven't told you my whole strategy. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> my entire strategy uh, is more than just center play. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> So, this is, we were able to control the exclusions for almost the entire season here, but when these kind of things happen, we cannot control the officials in, the situ, in this situation. So, in spring 2013, projects, what do we do with all this information? So, we decided that after, after going through, we decided we're going to take the season stats, we're going to analyze them. Off that analysis that we just showed you, okay, it spurred a video analysis project. So off of that, we decided to take the video analysis of center play and look at all the exclusions. And we tried to figure out how we could maybe be better at what we were doing. So we just took this really random stab at it, said, hey, play behind, play in a zone, do it this way, just super generic to try to give, our chance to, give ourselves a chance to win but test the theory. But can we be more efficient at it? Is there, are there opportunities out there? What can we do to improve it? So we decided to do a video analysis project. So we looked at all these situations from the entire season, not only just our team, but every single team we had video on. And then we took that and implemented all of those things that we saw inside the video to see if we could start to take the statistics. And in, every, in all the statistics, it tells you what's currently going on. But at the same time, it's also t telling you where the opportunities may lie to change the statistics. They're showing you insight into, well, it says this is pretty good, but right here, there's this negative value. Could we, is there an easy way to change that and decrease that? And if there is, then this becomes a much better choice. And so there's, there's opportunities in there. So that's what we did in the spring, and we changed uh, a number of techniques inside of our defense. And an update of where we're at now, this was 2014. These are the goals that were scored against us out of center. These are the missed shots. These were the new clocks. Okay, here's the total. And so if you remember back in the original slide, we were giving up two shots more per game, right? At a center. Now we've decreased that. Okay, and we've found a way to play a defense that controls that much better. And if you look at tw 22 goals for us out of center, 29 for them, we're right in the same ballpark. So, when Felix asks that question, when some people 
ask some other questions, warning this is not a complete picture. I am not divulging all the things that go have gone into this particular analysis, and I'm not divulging our, the complete system or everything that we look to do. Okay? So this does not take into account personnel. This does not take into account the depth of our teams that, I'm, that we're playing against, the personnel on our team, the personnel of the opponent, the depth of my team, the depth of an opponent's team. doesn't take into account the officials. Nice misspelling up there. Okay, it uh, doesn't take into account favorite underdog situations, which is a critical factor. Um, doesn't take into, came, into account game situation, opponent's strategy, because their strategy significantly dictates what, what's going to happen on shots and exclusions. Off, uh, their offensive system and the SWOT analysis, it does not include a SWOT analysis on zone defense as a whole. This was just showing you what's happening at the center position. So with that, you know, I'm sure there's some questions. And last time I didn't get a chance to do this, so I wanted to do this bad. So just bear with me. So Gold Rush is one of my favorite shows. I feel like we're mining gold. And so this is the introduction of the people that work with me. Okay, so it's just not me standing up here by myself being crazy, but uh, Grant Hulse right here is in, in the front row with Zach Kerner and uh, a number of other people, Adam Foley, John Mayberry, and these are the people that work a part of analytics, Water Polo Analytics Group. And at this point in time, um, we'd be happy to answer some questions. And Grant's here to ask question, uh, answer questions. So Zach, okay, myself, and the questions. Uh, last time I got questions that I couldn't answer all the time, so I thought I would help people out. Okay, and so here's my list of examples of happy to discuss questions. And those would be like, what do I need to start? Okay, which, you know, if you have a specific question that you're interested in, we could talk about that. Uh, how do you start tracking things? Explain uh, a certain part of the presentation, uh, preview matchups tomorrow, different things like that. What we can't talk about is how do we collect the data? How do we track it? Can, I, can you see my definitions? <laughs> can I publish the data? Can I talk about more? national team data or women's, uh, for men's or women's team because we work for both of them or MPSF stuff. If you ask me questions like this, just like we go back to the beginning, my goal is to help teach you how to fish, not to give you fish. So if you ask me these, I'm going to tell you to go fish. Okay?